Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. We from the team Baiju's wish you all a bright, colorful and joyful Holi. Let's get started and look into our daily quiz. Let's look into the first question. With respect to organization of Islamic cooperation, which of the following statements is our correct? It is the second largest organization after the United Nations. Iran was suspended from OIC after the Yemen crisis. The OIC has permanent delegations to the United Nations and the European Union. Which of the statements are correct? The answer to this is 1 and 3 only. Why have we taken this practice question? Because this article on the Hindu makes a reference to the OIC. Let us try and understand what are these options. When we look into the first option, yes, the OIC, which is nothing but the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, is the second largest organization after the United Nations. This statement is right. So, United Nations happens to be the largest organization and after the United Nations, what we have is the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Now, if you look into the third statement, the OIC has permanent delegations to the United Nations and Europe. European Union. This statement is once again right. But when it comes to the second statement, Iran was not suspended from OIC after the Yemen crisis. So after the Yemen crisis, was Iran suspended? No. There are about 57 countries which are part of OIC and they continue to be part of the OIC. Now if you look into some of the important facts, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation is an international organization founded in 1969 which consists of 57 member states and this organization happens to be the collective voice of the Muslim world and works to safeguard and protect the interests of the Muslim world in the spirit of promoting international peace and harmony. Where is it headquartered? It is headquartered in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. Its official languages are Arabic, English and French. OIC has permanent delegations to the United Nations and the European Union. Now let's look into the next practice question. Consider the following statements with respect to P waves and S waves. P waves create troughs and crests in the material through which they pass. S waves create density differences in the material leading to stretching and sequencing of the material. P waves can travel through solid, liquid and gas. S waves can only travel through solids and liquids. Which of the statements given above is are correct? The answer to this is none. Why have we taken this practice question? Because this article on the Hindu makes a reference to the earthquakes. When we speak about the earthquakes, we have something called as the P waves and the S waves. What are these P waves? P waves are the ones which are parallel to the direction of the wave. This exerts pressure on the material in the direction of the propagation and as a result, it creates density differences in the material leading to the stretching and the sequencing of the material. So this basically is an attribute of the P waves and not a characteristic of the S waves. Since the characteristic of the S wave is to create troughs and crust, the first option is wrong. When we look into the second option, P waves can travel through solid, liquid and gas. S waves can travel only through solids and liquids is also a wrong statement. Why? That is because when we speak about the P waves, yes, it can travel through the solid, liquid and gas. But when it comes to the S waves, it can only travel through the solids and not the liquids. So when we speak about the P waves, they vibrate parallel to the direction of the wave. When it comes to the S waves, they are in perpendicular to the wave direction. When it comes to the P waves, they are faster and first to arrive at the surface. Then we have the S waves which appear with a time lag. Last to report on the seismograph happens to be the S waves. So these are some of the differences when it comes to the P waves as well as the S waves. Now let's look into the next practice question. Which of the following has have been accorded the geographical indication tag? Darjeeling tea, Basmati rice, Nagpur oranges, Naga mircha, Jalgov banana. The answer to this is 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. Why have we taken this practice question? Because this article on the PIB makes a reference to the GI tag agricultural products. We have Darjeeling tea, we have Basmati rice, then the other products as well which includes the Kala Namak rice, Naga Mircha, Assam Kagi Nemo, Bangalore Rose Onion, Nagpur Oranges, then we have Shahi Lichi, Balia Wheat, Madurai Malli, Bardaman Mihidana, Dahanu Golwad Sapota, Jalgova Banana, 
Valakum Pineapple and Marayur Chakri. Added to this, there are other products as well which have been accorded the GA tag. Kindly go through them because this can be very important from the preliminary examination point of view. Now let's look into the next practice question. Consider the following statements with respect to sawfish. Sawfish are elasmobranch. Large tooth sawfish is listed as critically endangered on IUCN. Sawfishes are a protected species in India under Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. Which of the statements given above is our correct? The answer to this is 1, 2 and 3. Why have we taken this practice question? Because this article on the down to earth makes a reference to the sawfishes. When we speak about sawfishes, there are about five species of sawfishes. They are found across the world in the tropical and the subtropical waters. And this includes small tooth sawfish, large tooth sawfish, green sawfish. Then we have dwarf sawfish and finally the narrow tooth sawfish. Now, if you look into the options, sawfishes are elasmo branches. What do we mean by it? It means that they have a skeleton which is made up of cartilage rather than the bone. So, the term elasmo branch basically refers to the sharks, rays, and skates which are cartilaginous fishes. So, the first statement is right. When we look into the second statement, the large tooth sawfish is listed as critically endangered on IUCN. So, yes, the large tooth sawfish is listed as critically endangered endangered and as part of the assignment you have to put on the comment section there are other four species as well what is the IUCN status of small tooth sawfish green sawfish dwarf sawfish as well as the narrow tooth sawfish please check for the IUCN status and please put them on the comment section now the third statement says sawfishes are protected species in India under schedule 1 of the wildlife protection act of 1972 this is once again a right statement which basically means it is given that level of protection where it is similar to the magnitude of the tiger and the elephant what are the major threats to these species sawfish are the most threatened species. Why? That is because they are threatened largely by the fishing. They are also threatened by the habitat modification as well. And recently, we also had an instance in the state of Karnataka where the rare and critically endangered sawfish was caught in the fishing nets in Karnataka's Malpe region as well. Now, let's look into the next practice question. Consider the following statements. Moringa is a leguminous evergreen tree. Tamarind tree is endemic to South Asia. In India, most of the tamarind is collected as minor forest produce. India exports tamarind and seeds of moringa. Seeds of moringa and tamarind can be used in the production of biofuels. Which of the statements given above are correct? The answer to this is B, which is nothing but 3, 4 and 5. Why is the first statement wrong? That is because Moringa is not necessarily a evergreen tree. When we look into the second statement, Tamarind tree is endemic to South Asia. This is a wrong statement. It is indigenous to Africa. So the second statement is out. So what we are left with is 3, 4 and 5. And this happens to be the right statement. This is a previous year question from the year 2021. Now let's look into the fact of the day. The fact of the day for today's discussion is India's Arctic policy. What is this India's Arctic policy? What was the need of coming up with this policy? And what is the significance of this policy? Is what is this topic all about? Let's go back to the year 1920. In the year 1920, there were many signatory countries who signed what is called as the Svalbard Treaty. One of the important principles of this treaty is to ensure that this particular region does not become militarized. So India respects this very principle that Arctic region will have to be explored but at the same time it should not be militarized. So remember the Svalbard Treaty is in reference to the Arctic region which principally says that this particular region should not be militarized and India respects this very principle. What was the need of coming up with this particular policy? That is because of the major factor of climate change. We are all living in an integrated world. Yes, we do have the political boundaries but the Mother Earth does not know about the political boundaries. She sees the Earth as one 
one whole kingdom. So what exactly is the issue here? If there is a problem in any of the countries with respect to the climate change, the same impact will be felt on some other country as well. If climate change is having an impact on the Arctic region, every other country is bound to suffer because climate change is not just restricted to a country, to a region, but it is integrated throughout the world. So understanding how climate change will have an impact on the Arctic region, which can have its repercussions felt on every other country with special emphasis to India is the major idea behind India's Arctic policy. So what is India's Arctic policy? It is about trying to understand the impact of climate change in Arctic having its repercussions felt in India. So it is based on six major pillars. One is about strengthening India's scientific research and cooperation, climate and environmental protection, economic and human development, transportation and connectivity, governance and international cooperation and finally national capacity building in the Arctic region. So all that India is trying to do is create this India's Arctic policy whereby we would be able to advance on the scientific exploration part, understand how climate change will have impact on India. We do have Himalayas as well. It also has similar climatic region as well. It also has similar weather conditions as well. So will studying the Arctic region would be able to extract some information with respect to the Himalayan ecosystem is another aspect of India's Arctic policy. In order to give boost to it, India in the past has accomplished number of parameters. Back in the year 2007, we had the Indian scientists who undertook India's first Arctic expedition. Why? Because they wanted to study about glaciology, biological sciences, ocean and atmospheric sciences with respect to the Arctic region. In the year 2008, India also set up a research center and this happens to be Himadri. So remember, Himadri happens to be a research center undertaken by India at the International Arctic Research Base at Svalbard in Norway. And India continues to advance scientific exploration projects in this part of the Arctic region. So what is this Arctic policy all about? Strengthening national capabilities and competencies in science exploration, climate and environmental protection, maritime and economic cooperation with the Arctic region, inter-ministerial coordination in pursuit of India's interest in the Arctic. So what we will have is multiple ministries and departments where they need to be gelled up, where they need to be coordinated, where there has to be an integration process as to how this entire proceedings have to be done. So the coordination will be taken into picture, enhancing understanding of the impact of climate change in the Arctic on India's climate, economic and energy security, contributing better analysis, prediction and coordinated policy making on the implications of ice melting in the Arctic on India's economic, military and strategic interest related to global shipping routes, energy security, exploitation of mineral wealth. What do we mean by it? As there is climate change, yes, it will have negative implications as well. But to a minimal extent, it will also have positive impact as well. How? Let's say for example, this is the Arctic region. As of now, it has ice caps. You would not be able to move in these ice caps. But with the melting, it will also open up the sea corridors as well. And this means that we would be able to pass through the Arctic region. And at the same time, we can also explore oil from this region and we can also look for other resources in the Arctic region. So trying to understand if there are any economic advantages with this region because of the climate change induced factors is another objective of India's Arctic policy. Studying linkages between polar regions and the Himalayas, deepen cooperation between India and the countries of the Arctic region under various Arctic forums, drawing expertise from the scientific and traditional knowledge and finally in India's increasing participation in the Arctic Council and improving understanding of the complex governance structure in the Arctic, relevant international laws and geopolitics of the region. So there are countries in and around the Arctic region, coordinating with them, getting the knowledge base from them, interacting with them and also sharing the information is the picture of the India's Arctic policy. 
who will implement this program the national center for polar and ocean research and autonomous institute under the ministry of earth sciences is a nodal institution for india's polar research program which includes the arctic studies so what is the significance of this particular policy basically with this policy what we would be able to do is understand the climate change whose impact and repercussions can be felt in india so in advance we would know what could be the possible repercussions and we can take precautionary measures to prevent or mitigate the impact of climate change in this particular region it is this that we have to understand in reference to this article so this is it for today thank you for watching all the best